Hello to all of our listeners, our Pleasant Green Church family, and the congregation at a, as a whole. Once again, it is a privilege and an honor to come before you uh, to indulge into the Word of God and to study uh, that we may gain understanding and that our understanding may make us better equipped and informed to serve Almighty God and fulfill His will in our lives. This is Minister Leonard Harris, and we are on November the 7th, uh, the year according to the calendar. We're almost near the end. And just as things come to an end, we then begin again. <laughs> so our lesson for this Sunday is Lesson 10 for November the 7th, 2021. And it's from Unit 3, Visions of Praise. The rest of the story is the title for this Sunday's lesson, again from our Faith Pathway Study Guide. And our devotional reading is Revelations chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, our background scripture, and our printed passage are Revelations 7, verses 9 through 17. And our key verse is, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And this is Revelations 7 and verse 14. And our lesson's aims are, understand how God's salvation and justice for all people inspire praise and worship. Embrace the significance of praising God in unity. Respond to God's love, goodness, and grace with joy and exaltation. And as always, we pray that the eternal God and creator of all that is would be present with us and impart unto us the things that God Almighty would have us to know. We just ask that his spirit will be first and foremost in this indulgence and that we will be the recipients of what God has already set before us. And our prayer is that these words and the utterance that we hear will not just fall on stony ground, but fertile soil, and then return unto God as God has told us that his word would not go forth and return unto him void. And we ask this all in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, the Anointed One, and for his sake, we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> Our lesson, as usual, has three parts to it. And uh, the first part is all praise, followed by all proclaim, followed by all protected. All praise, all proclaim, and all protect it. And so that uh, we have a 
clearer understanding of the verses that we are addressing in the seventh chapter of Revelations. Uh, in our leisure, it would be beneficial to us if we would read through the sixth chapter of Revelations because it unfolds unto us these uh, this acknowledgement of all praise, all proclaim, and all protected. Reading through the sixth chapter of Revelations uh, gives us some clarity and insight into why these uh, descriptions or these uh, titles to the diff three different sections, uh, why they were chosen. And I would just uh, highlight uh, some of the key points out of the sixth chapter of Revelations. Uh, when we look at what is being revealed and what is being discussed, they are lumped into different topics. And uh, the first uh, couple of verses are addressed as the first seal. And it is titled, The False Christ. And then verses 3 and 4 speaks about war. And the 5 and 6 talk about famine. And then uh, on to the 4th, it talks about death. And then the martyred remnant. And then anarchy. And so to have a full picture, a better perspective on why all praise, why all protected, and why all proclaim, uh, to understand it better, and for the following scriptures to be f more fruitful uh, in their description, uh, one would like to understand what preceded the seventh chapter, which now uh, is proposed to us in the fashion of we should be in praise, we should be proclaiming, and then we should feel protected. And so as we look at this, now uh, we all know that the book of Revelations is the book of revealed things. But the revealed things are somewhat, for the lack of a better word, codified. They're presented in symbols, in signs, in imagery, um, illustrations, and so our focus here would not be to try and unravel all of what Revelations imparts unto us. We would need way more time than the time allowed. Uh, but that's not an excuse and that's not a escape. But I would uh, say this that a lot of the imagery and a lot of the symbolism and signs uh, which have been projected and presented by the hands of um, men and through the translations um, and now uh, being connected to understandings and somewhat uh, explained and illustrated 
during the times in the writings of the scriptures. And this does not at all negate or or, um, decrease that scripture is written by the spiritual utterance of God. But through time, it's translated and depicted in forms that sometimes are misleading. And in this day and time, even with the best of our theoreticians and theologians, uh, confusion is conveyed. So as we look in the scripture, we realize that it opens up and it talks about all praise. And then it identifies that <clears throat> John looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count. And the number was revealed or it was, it was accumulated by many nations, tribes, people, and language. And they were all standing before the throne, before the Lamb of God. They were wearing white robes, showing that they had been purified, uh, that they had been cleansed, that they had been restored, and that they were holding palm branches and symbolizing peace. Now, when we look at verse 6, this chapter 6, and realize these are those who came through the tribulation. They came through war. They came through the false Christ. They came through the famine, and they came through the martyred remnant, and they came through all of those uh, tragedies and those experiences that were lifted in the sixth chapter. So, when we say all praise, certainly, if one has been challenged and one has actually come through a period of trials and test and tribulation and devastation, certainly on the other side of that, one would definitely be in a spirit of praise. So when we look at what has transpired prior to the seventh chapter, we recognize why the lesson says all should be in praise. And it gives us depictions of what uh, this praise is a collection of. When we look at the world today, we see more division among the people that God created. And I don't identify all people that God created as the people of God. But certainly God created all humankind. And so when we think of the, this, uh, uh, this, shall we say, blessed, certainly blessed, uh, occasion and outcome here. Sometimes it's difficult for us to come together. One would say when things are good, when we are in the reception of God's grace and mercy and kindness, forgiveness and provisions, uh, one would think that we would be more conducive to giving praise and honor and glory and coming together and recognizing that there is a 
God, a spirit, a entity that is ruling all and providing all and protecting all. And that would be a reason why we would come together. But as we look today, as we look at the world, not just at the U.S. of A. or America, but when we look at the world, it seems that what really brings us together is what we hope never is present. And that is division, disunity, that is strife, that's war, that is false teaching, that is calamities, that is famine. Uh, when these things happen, for some reason, they have more of a magnetism and an attraction to bring us together and unify us than when, for the lack of a better phrase, than when we're living off the fat of the calf. So what is being said to us here, and I am going to close by lifting... Uh, a uh, understanding about the four living creatures that fell down on their face before the throne um, and worshiped God. So as we uh, look at all proclaim, all proclaim what? All proclaim what? And the scripture says, saying amen, or saying it is so, praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power, strength to our God forever and ever and ever. And then one of the elders asked, these in the white robes. Uh, who are they? And where did they come from? And the answer was, sir, you know. He said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. When we look at the introduction uh, to the book of Revelations, and when we uh, start at the first chapter, uh, since our background scripture is from uh, the first chapter of Revelations, verses 1 through 8, the eighth verse utters in why verses 12 begin by saying blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving, honor, power, and strength to our God forever and ever and ever. And what verse 8 says is, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I am he who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Alpha and the Omega. Now, if that is not enough to cause us to proclaim and give honor and give credence and recognition and praise and glory to the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come, the Alpha and the Omega. And when we think of the enormity of God, the vastness of God, when we just reflect upon 
how powerful the Spirit of God is. You must always remember that in the beginning, it's always good to go back to the beginning when we clarify things because Scripture says that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. It said the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And in the fourth chapter of the book of John, it says that the time is now that the true worshipers of God must worship God in spirit and in truth. For God seeks that type of worship. And so, uh, because we uh, personalized God and made God a he, and then in the uh, trend and age of plurality, uh, we've now even identified God that God is she. We do understand, though, totally that scripture does tell us that male and female created he them. So we recognize that there is a male and female principle and spirit in the spiritual presence of God. But we want to just uh, recognize that truly God is spirit. Now, as we move further and as we come to our close, um, I want to address what I just voiced uh, from this perspective because this ties in uh, to the description uh, in the end of our 11th verse and it talks about the four living creatures. Um, of course, this also is in the fourth chapter, in the opening of the fourth chapter of Revelations. It's also in the first chapter of Ezekiel. I believe it starts at the fourth uh, verse, going through fourth, uh, fifth, and sixth verses of the first chapter of Ezekiel. Um, but I want to lift this first because earlier when I was speaking about the translations and when I was speaking about uh, the depictions and the wording of how uh, scriptural texts, though originally uttered in spirit of God, but through time and ages, uh, through translations, through different uh, uh, explanations uh, of the word of God, it, it created, it allowed other interpretations. And many times these other interpreta interpretations have been misleading. So I wanted to address that from another perspective. And that is from the first chapter of Romans. And I will begin it uh, at the 18th verse. So Romans 1, beginning at the 18th verse. And, and just as a, uh, a subtitle here, it opens by addressing these verses as the whole world is guilty before God. Now that is significant being how that we know in our lesson today, uh, those that are called unto God from many different nations and tribes and people and languages, that God, even though here in Romans it says the whole world is guilty before God, in the end, after the tribulation, 
God is still calling the whole world and his people from all parts of the world. But let's listen to what God is saying. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. So there was no excuse as to uh, we didn't know, we didn't understand. It says because what is uh, of what is known of God is manifest to them, for God has shown it to them. And then it goes on and says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. But it says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile, in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Now, I lift that because stated earlier, we said that we have symbolism and imagery and signs and illustrations in the text, which... When we fully understand what they identify, then they bring clarity to our understanding. Now, when we, be, when we begin speaking of uh, these four beasts, and I'm sure that uh, many are familiar uh, as they are identified Identified as a lion, a calf, or a bull, a man, or a face with the likeness of a man, and a flying eagle. These are identified, uh, and I'm identifying them from the fourth chapter of Revelations, verses uh, 7. Uh, but also, as I mentioned, it's also in Ezekiel, in the vision that Ezekiel saw. And scripture here is telling us about the visions that John saw that were revealed, truth that was revealed to John in visions. Things that were spoken to John by the angel, the servant, the messenger of God. Now, when uh, we look at this, I want us to uh, address it and recognize that we're not speaking of anything uh, that is... Uh, man-made. We're not uh, discussing uh, man's analogies or uh, alluding to the understanding of man, but we are engaging into how Scripture reveals to us uh, what God's creation, what God's creation has brought before us 
So, so that we are clear on this, uh, the 19th number of Psalms says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Whose voice? It didn't mention a person. It said, the heavens declare his glory and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. And then it says, day and night said that the day utters speech and that the night reveals knowledge. And throughout all the land, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So when we listen to what scripture is saying to us, it's telling us that God's creation, the heavens, the stars, the sun, the moon, the um, presence and constellations, it's telling us that God speaks to all of God's creation in a language that all of God's creation understands. How can God speak to the entire world in one voice without there being misinterpretation? He speaks through creation. There's no, um, there's no, uh, uh, discounting or there's there's no uh, discrepancies or there's no um, uh, misguiding uh, or misunderstanding in God's creation. The sun is the sun for all of God's creation. The moon is the moon for all. The stars are the stars for all. The scripture says they portell knowledge and understanding. And there's no deviation in it. One can't say, no, the sun is this color over here. And then another hemisphere is saying, no, it's not. It's this color over here. No, the sun is the same color everywhere. The moon is the same everywhere. The stars are the same everywhere. So when scripture said that one of the images was a lion, one was a calf or an ox, one was the face of the man, one was a flying eagle. That is the imagery. That is the symbolism. That is the artwork that man gave to God's creation. When we talk about the righteousness of God, when we talk about the equality of God, when we talk about the justice of God, it is spoken through God's creation. So what are they telling us when they use these colorful Im imagery uh, uh, depictions of God's heavenly bodies what are they telling us those images are connected to constellations they speak of the spring and the autumn equinoxes the summer and the winter solstice when we look at those images depicted around the uh, circumference of God's creation in astronomy, that is the depictions of the constellation given animal 
formation, which God spoke against in the book of Romans, talking about man changing the invisible, incorruptible image of God and then presenting it in animal form to give credence to animal explanations and depictions instead of identifying that spring and autumn equinoxes represent the equality of God. It is at these times in God's creation that the day and the night are equal. And to show how just God is, it shows that in the spring, when life is coming anew again, Day and night are equal. In the fall, when life begins to change and now it is going into another phase, day and night are equal again. But when the sun is at its highest point, the days are longer, the nights are shorter, but again, to show that God is just, that God is equal, that God is righteous, what he did on time for the sun, he also did in time for the moon. Because in the winter solstice, the nights are longer and the days are shorter. And in Genesis, the first chapter, the 14th verse, God said, let there be light in the firmaments and created the sun and the moon. And he said, let them be for signs, seasons, days, and years. What are the signs and the seasons? Signs are signals. They point to certain events Seasons for God, seasons are not just spring, summer, uh, autumn, and fall. I mean, uh, fall and winter. But for God, seasons are appointed times. Appointed times. So I wanted to address that because a lot of times, uh, we get caught up into the imagery of Scripture and don't understand what they are really speaking of. Be, but see, before man had the intelligence to write, there was still spring. There was still a summer. There was still an autumn. There was still a winter. Before man was able to understand and intellectualize what he was experiencing, without the assistance of man, God still had these things being foretold and shown to man in God's creation. And then man, after he began to recognize what God had done in the heavenly bodies by the power of his spirit, then man begins to define for God what God is going to do and when. Based upon what he thinks he sees. So, as we come to the close, it says all protected and therefore they are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They will never again hunger, nor will they thirst. The sun would not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat, 
for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. And we certainly hope that something was said that will give us better or greater insights into who it is that we serve and the unlimited amount of power that God has. God bless you and God keep you.